really proved difficult to maintain believing in what they know to be a truth when millions of dollars are at stake. During the last hundred years, asbestos fibers have been used in thousands of different products in the construction industry, in shipyards and in households. It was seen as a magic mineral and the use of millions of tons of asbestos created a successful and very profitable industry even though that self-same industry was well aware that asbestos was extremely dangerous. But despite this awareness, the use of asbestos was allowed to develop into one of the biggest occupational health problems of the century, leading to thousands of deaths. And not only for those involved in its manufacture, but for all who came in contact with it. In big production at a Rochdale plant is a new material likely to play a useful part in fighting fire. It's an aluminized asbestos cloth. In the safely open spaces of Oldham Park, the county firemen got themselves up like invaders from another planet. Two gallons of petrol were sacrificed in the good cause, and the stage was set for the drama Man versus Fire. Mankind has always been fascinated by asbestos. From the early beginnings of its manufacture in Canada at the end of the 19th century, the small mineral fibers of which it's composed have filled people with enthusiasm because despite their being soft as silk, they're as solid as granite and can be used in many different applications. Asbestos was promoted, uh, the sales pitch was to call it the magic mineral. Uh, they uh, mainly were able to sell this because it had very good resistance to chemicals, heat, and it had high tensile strength. In European and American industrialization, asbestos was inextricably linked with the potent symbols of progress. Machines, steamships, and large building construction. At the beginning of the 20th century, the mineral was marketed as Lady Asbestos, a Greek goddess armed with a shield to protect civilization. Numerous factories sprang up and thousands of workers gained employment in the asbestos industry. But as in many other factories at that time, working conditions were extremely dusty. We know from the documents that have survived that the conditions were very dusty and there are stories that workers couldn't see more than six to ten feet in certain parts of the factories. But dust was an accepted fact of life in many industries in those days. Cotton factories were very dusty, the coal mines were, were even dustier. So. Asbestos factories were not that unusual in having a dust problem. It was just that asbestos was uniquely dusty and also, as it turned out, uniquely dangerous. As early as 1898, a factory inspector in Britain warned against what she described as the evil dust. In Britain, the government uh, hired a medical inspector of factories and uh, under his direction, the lady inspectors of factories went out and did investigations. And one of the things that they reported in the year 1898 was that there were people getting uh, lung disease from working around asbestos. And they recognized that this was a dangerous material. The lady inspectors actually referred to the evil effects of asbestos dust. At the beginning of the 20th century, more asbestos-connected deaths came to light and as early as 1906, a factory inspector in France learned of 50 deaths among female workers. In the years to come, suspicions grew more widespread, leading to American and Canadian insurance companies taking legal precautions to protect against possible claims. By 1918 in the United States, an insurance industry official published a report describing uh, mortality in dusty trades. And in this report, the insurance official said that it was generally the practice of American and Canadian life insurance companies to not sell life insurance to asbestos workers on account of the, the hazards of their trade, based on reported deaths from such causes as uh, tuberculosis and pneumonia. 
Yet still, no one would admit the full extent of the inherent dangers. It finally took the death of a British woman, Nellie Kershaw, to contribute in helping to unravel the mystery surrounding these dangers, with the inquest into her death resulting in a year-long battle over principles of responsibility and compensation. Nellie Kershaw was a young woman who worked at Britain's leading asbestos company, Turner Brothers, in Rochdale. Uh, she died in 1924, and it's an important case because it was the first case in which there was an inquest. The inquest received extensive coverage in the local newspaper, the Rochdale Observer, and presented evidence that told her lungs were peppered with numerous, minute, sharp fibres which had cut directly into her lung tissue, causing thousands of tiny scars, until eventually her lungs could no longer function and she died of suffocation. The coroner in charge of the inquest described the cause of death as asbestos poisoning. But Turner Brothers, the company she'd worked for, rejected his findings. Turner Brothers never accepted responsibility for Nellie Kershaw's death, and basically she was never given any compensation by the company. Um, you must remember that at that time there was no, the government compensation scheme had not yet been introduced. So officially she had a disease which didn't exist. When Nellie Kershaw's widower asked Turner Brothers for financial support in order to cover funeral expenses, his request was flatly refused, lest it create a precedent of admitting responsibility thereby encouraging demands from other past or present employees. Three years later, the coroner in charge of the inquest summarised his observations in the British Medical Journal and during decades to follow, thousands of victims would learn the name of their affliction, asbestosis. Following the publication of the Nellie Kershaw case, the British government decided to embark on a survey of asbestosis in the industry, and they, they examined over 300 workers, and then they reported on this in 1930, showing that over one-fourth of these workers had asbestosis. And the longer they'd worked in the industry, the higher the prevalence of asbestosis. There were so many workers dying from asbestosis that the government had to intervene. They found that the situation was so disastrous that they needed to introduce specific regulations to compel the factory owners to clean up the factories and also um, to offer medical examinations and compensation to affected workers. The law, adopted in 1931, was the first of its kind in the world, but it was far from adequate for the industry managed to have a decisive influence on the final drawing up of the law. The industry, for its part, uh, wanted to limit the scope of the law, and they were successful in making it so that the law only applied to the most heavily exposed workers in the manufacturing plants. And this was very uh, helpful to the industry from a marketing standpoint because the people who use these products, the millions of people in the construction industry and in the shipyards, were not covered at all by these regulations. The practical uses of asbestos are very numerous. At least 18,000 articles are made of it, ranging from packing for steam engines and linings for friction surfaces to bulkheads for aeroplanes. No, not a member of a secret society, nor a medicine man, but an asbestos shield for firefighting. Asbestos comes into the home in the shape of fireproof curtains and covers, and in a variety of patterns. They are one answer to the problem of the careless smoker. Ash, but no char. If, in a playful moment, you feel you'd like to make a bonfire of the tablecloth, see that it isn't made of asbestos. Simultaneously, alongside the development of new products utilising asbestos, more reports were published by British factory inspectors about their suspicions that asbestos also caused lung cancer. The American asbestos giant, Johns Manville, 
decided in all secrecy to conduct laboratory research on mice and rats. The researcher along the way became curious about cancer and he allowed these animals to live out their full lives and it turned out that 9 of 11 of uh, these animals in this group developed lung cancer. But the companies kept him from publishing that. He died in 1946 and uh, the new director of the laboratory wrote up the study that uh, had been done by his predecessor. He included reference to tumors and cancer and the companies who were the sponsors, executive vice presidents and presidents of these companies met in the boardroom at the Johns Manville Corporation in November of 1948. And they sent uh, back directions to the laboratory, take out all reference to cancer and tumors. And the author of the study did just that.